So the next topic we're going to get into is simplifying radicals and solving radical equations, and we're even going to graph one at the end of it. When we have numbers like 50, 500, 72, et cetera, if you put them in your calculator, you're going to get a decimal answer. You can't give a decimal answer. So what that means is you just have to square root them by breaking them down into numbers you can square root. So I know that 50 becomes the square root of 25 times the square root of 2. I always recommend that you write the perfect square first so that you don't screw up your answer. What typically happens if you write it second is you confuse what goes under the square root and what doesn't. Another thing I like to do is circle the one I can square root. I know that the square root of 25 is 5. Square root of 2 then stays the same. Here's our answer. Another common mistake is to write the square root of 25 is the square root of 5. But that's not true. It's just 5 root 2. In this one, okay, number 2, the square root of 500, I know 100 is a perfect square, and I have 5. Well, circle the one you can root. The square root of 100 is 10. The root 5 doesn't change. Here's our answer. Another thing you want to look for, too, is always find the biggest perfect square. You know, when you're doing 500, I'm sure that there's another perfect square in there that's divisible by it, but it's not as big as 100. So you always want to find the biggest perfect square that goes into it. For instance, 72. This, I could do the square root of 8 and square root of 9, okay, which would be 3 root 8. But then you'd have to break down the 8, which would be 4 and 2. So now this would become 3 times 2 root 2, which is 6 root 2. You get the same answer, but if you do it the way that we tell you to do it by finding the biggest, it's root 36 times the square root of 2. That becomes 6 root 2. You should see you get the same answer either way. One is much shorter than the other. So you always want to find that biggest root. Sometimes you might even get lucky, get a problem like number 4. Well, 25, yeah, it breaks to 5 and 5, but if you just test it, the square root of 25 is 5. 80 is another common one that's messed up. It's the square root of 16 times the square root of 5. This becomes 4 root 5. There's your answer. Number 6, 44 becomes root 4 times root 11. I can square root 4 to get 2. The root 11 doesn't change. There's your answer. So those are just simple break down one number not much to it, not complicated. Okay? The next ones when you're multiplying, I always like to go ahead and multiply the numbers under the root. So I know that 5 times 15 is 75. Okay? 75 breaks to 25 times 3. I can square root that number to get 5 root 3. There's my answer. Number 11 in this case, what I do is Multiply the two numbers out front. 3 times 5 is 15. Then I go ahead and multiply the two roots together. Square root of 28. All right, well, now I've got to break down that 28. So it's 15 times the square root of 4 times the square root of 7. That's the number I can root. It becomes 15 times 2 root 7. Your final answer is 30 root 7. Okay. Then when we get to ones where they add, you cannot add those unless they're the same number. The way I always compare this to is if you have 4x plus 4x, well, that would become 6x. So here, 2 root 5 plus 4 root 5s, you have 6 root 5. That's your answer. You can always compare these very similarly to x's and y's. So on that same note, if I look at 23, if I pretend these were x's and y's, I would have x plus 5y, which we can't add together because they're not like terms. That means I've got to break something down. 18 becomes root 9 root 2 plus 5 root 2. This gives me 3 root 2 plus 5 root 2, which is 8 square root of 2. There's your final answer. All right. Again, in number 26 here, they're not the same number underneath the root. Let's change it. 18 is 9 and 2. 50 is 25 and 2. I can root 9. I can root 25. Gives me 4 times 3 square root of 2 minus 5 square root 2. 
these two numbers multiply to 12 root 2 minus 5 root 2, which becomes 7 root 2, final. So there's adding and subtracting. Now let's go ahead and get to solving radical equations. If you remember, when we get rid of a squared to both sides, we square root it. Very similarly, when we get rid of a square root, we square it. I always say that squaring and square rooting are opposites. This helps you remember what to do on which problem. Okay. So they're opposites. So in this case, I'm going to subtract 3 to both sides. Gives me the square root of x equals 7. Now I'm going to square both sides to get rid of a square root. You get x equals 49. Okay, pretty simple. Well, number 5 looks a little bit different because the square root's by itself, but there's numbers under it. Same thing, square both sides. You get x minus 2 equals 64. Going to add 2 to both sides. You get x equals 66. Now we've got to try to break it down if possible. Or excuse me, no, you're done at that point. x equals 66. 10 is the toughest type for these because we go ahead and square both sides. You get x squared equals x minus 4. Well, now I've got to get these all on the same side so I can say g. So I'm going to subtract 5x to both sides. x squared minus 5x equals negative 4. Now I'm going to go ahead and add 4. Okay, obviously that cancels, that cancels. x squared minus 5x plus 4 equals 0. We mag. 4, negative 5, my numbers are negative 4, negative 1, so x minus 4 times x minus 1 equals 0. This tells us that x equals 4, x equals 1. Got to be careful. If you solve these and you get a negative number, it can't work because you cannot square root a negative. Two numbers will never multiply to each other to make a negative. So if you get to a situation where you have x equals a negative number, you know that it's got to be crossed off. Okay. The last thing we're going to do is go ahead and graph a radical function. The first thing you should always do here is find domain. You find domain by setting whatever is under square root, under square root, you set it greater than or equal to 0. So I look at this. I see that there's only an x under my square root. So I say x is greater than or equal to 0. Found my domain. I also found the first number I put in my x value of the table. After you find domain, you have to find the rest of the numbers of the table. So here, I'm going to plug in 0. Get the square root of 0 minus 3. Gives me negative 3. The next number I know I can root is 1. Square root of 1 minus 3 is negative 2. The next number we can root is 4. Square root of 4 minus 3 gives me negative 1. The next number is 9. Square root of 9 minus 3 gives me 0. The next number would be 16. Square root of 16 minus 3 gives me 1. You should notice a pattern with the y's. It goes 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1. It goes in order. Okay. Now, the good news is this number represents our domain. This number represents our range. So here I can say y greater than or equal to negative 3. Now all we do is we take these points and plot them. Plot them. 0, negative 3, right there. 1, negative 2, 4, negative 1, 9, 0, which would be like right there. Make our graph, and there you have it. So simple steps. Whatever is under the square roots of your domain, set it greater than or equal to 0. Then you just plug in perfect squares or what would make perfect squares from there. So this wraps up everything we need to know with radical functions, simplifying radicals, and graphing radicals.